Hello, everyone. Well, welcome back to uh, session two uh, and uh, a chance for us to focus on a critical part of the Indo-Pacific strategy focusing on Southeast Asia. Uh, I want to, I'm, I'm Paul Evans, I know some of you in the room. Uh, I am a professor emeritus at University of British Columbia, which is a fancy way of saying a pensioner uh, in, the, in, in the context of, uh, of, of university life. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to uh, moderate this session focused on Southeast Asia and ASEAN, uh, in part because um, it's a vital part of the Canadian Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, and in part because of the way this event has been structured. It's wonderful that the IPD has been able to work with the colleagues from the uh, Canada West Foundation uh, and uh, the other sponsors. Uh, this is a lively, thriving enterprise. Now, one difference between this year's session and last year's session is last year we were organized, we, we convened under the umbrella of Asia Pacific. Uh, this year, Indo-Pacific, and that reflects the positions of the Canadian government, uh, and it, I think, reflects some movement uh, among many Canadians in putting a new frame. The shift in vocabulary is not inconsequential an Asia-Pacific world uh, of, a, of, a, of another era, and an Indo-Pacific world that is just being born, we have an overlap, uh, not just in vocabulary, sometimes Asia-Pacific, sometimes Indo-Pacific, but the visions, the strategic uh, conceptions, economically and political security terms, between those two different formulations of the region that we're, we're, uh, that we're discussing. And we'll get into some of those, uh, those issues today. Uh, we're um, uh, dealing with Southeast Asia because I think everyone in this room realizes that in the Indo-Pacific strategy, Canada's version of an Indo-Pacific strategy, Southeast Asia really did have a central role in this document. Um, it, uh, for some obvious reasons in its geographic centrality, but also because that Southeast Asia and trade issues, which we'll be getting into, it's commercially important. But Southeast Asia is an area of contestation among great powers. Uh, it's also a region with enormous agency, um, its own institutions, and distinctive approaches to the geopolitical, geoeconomic, strategic issues of the day. So uh, concentrating on Southeast Asia is valuable, not just because of the weather contrast, those of us who came over in the slush this morning, we're thinking fondly of Southeast Asia with every step, uh, but that um, it means something. If we don't get Southeast Asia right and don't find the right ways to align with ASEAN uh, as an organization, but also individual countries and the ideas and the flow and the positioning of that region, I think our Indo-Pacific strategy is in for big trouble. And the Indo-Pacific strategy has committed considerable resources to Southeast Asia. Time-wise, what did we hear from the general 23 references in the document? But also some institutional initiatives, a new office for the Asia Pacific Foundation uh, in the region, a new trade kind of czar for Indo-Pacific based in Jakarta. These are, in addition to the activities that were outlined earlier, uh, some important initiatives. Well, today we've got a, a pretty interesting panel of um, uh, four people who uh, live and breathe and think Southeast Asia on a, on a, on a regular basis. And um, I'll introduce their, their names are mentioned uh, on your uh, uh, program uh, that is in front of you uh, to just tell you who they are before I turn to them. Uh, Kai Oswald, my, my colleague from UBC, who is not a pensioner, uh, but is an active, uh, active member uh, and leading force on uh, Malaysia, in, in, uh, Singapore studies, but he's also been a real mover and shaker in trying to build networks of Southeast Asian specialists in Canada and connecting them to government. 
um, Alice Ba, who's beside me here today. Uh, Alice is a professor at the University of Delaware and has been a, uh, a kind of creative China specialist who had discovered and interacted with Southeast Asia and is superb on international institutions, uh, China's role, but also regional role. She's that beautiful hybrid of the region of an Indo-Pacific or a, a broad Pacific specialist, uh, knows a lot about the United States, knows a lot about uh, China, and also knows a lot about Southeast Asia and its institutions. She's with us in person. I also see on the screen two people who are joining us from distance. Uh, the first is uh, 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 Devi Fortuna Anwar from Jakarta. Devi, can you hear me? Yes, hi Paul, I can hear you. Oh, wonderful to have you with us again in Canada, if only virtually this time. Uh, Devi is a, um, uh, is a seasoned academic and policy uh, advisor, having worked with the president and a couple of uh, vice presidents in Indonesia as a foreign policy advisor, uh, also as a, a researcher. And Devi, I see that you're at a uh, new organization uh, no longer uh, uh, at the, uh, uh, the one that I knew you in most closely, but Davey is at the, um, let me see if I get the title right. What is it, what is the name of your organization? Well, this is a new super agency called the National Research and Innovation Agency, uh, which integrated all of the uh, previous uh, state research agencies. Uh, you knew me when I was at the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, OLIPI. So now LIPI is no more. It's been integrated under this new National Research and Innovation Agency, or BRIM, as we call it in Indonesia. Wow. So it's a huge organization, yeah. Uh, initiatives with Indonesian characteristics, so many creative things. And uh, we have as our fourth panelist, uh, Diana Horton, who is a former diplomat, now academic world at the Monk School at the uh, University of Toronto, and pays a lot of attention to uh, Southeast Asia, particularly from an economic angle. And we have, uh, so in that sense, people who deal with uh, uh, the geopolitics and the geoeconomics. Well, let's start. And the format is going to be, I'm going to raise a question to uh, each of our panelists to uh, kind of get them to chip in their basic views. And uh, we will then do a second round of trying to knit some things together. But I will be leaving time for people on the, in the floor to ask questions. And um, uh, this, we almost are gonna have to make a rule that academics won't be the first to speak <laughs> at the podium. So those of you from government, no hiding. Uh, those of you from private sector, jump into the discussion when that opportunity comes, please do. Well, let's start. Um, Kai, you uh, have been looking at the Indo-Pacific strategy, the, um, and particularly with the Southeast Asian dimension of it. Uh, did Canada, did our, our policy community get it right in putting ASEAN and Southeast Asia, not identically the same, but putting them at the center of the Indo-Pacific strategy? Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Let me start by saying that it isn't just Canada that has foregrounded Southeast Asia across the spectrum of Indo-Pacific strategies or documents, Southeast Asia features prominently. And, and as you alluded to, and as we heard this morning, there are many reasons for that. There are some obvious ones. The economic opportunity at a time when global instability is, is compelling countries to look to diversify their partnerships, economic and otherwise. Uh, on that front, Southeast Asia offers a lot of opportunity. Right? Dynamic economies, some of the most, some of the most rapidly growing in the world, and importantly also demographic profiles that position Southeast Asia well to continue growing for the next two or three decades. Right? From a geopolitical perspective, you know, ASEAN centrality is exactly what it sounds like. Um, ASEAN is geographically located in the midst of two rising powers that, that we should expect to play a significant role in the, in the global order over the next two or three decades. So from that perspective, building strengths 
building stronger partnerships, engaging Southeast Asia in more constructive ways is, is an obvious. Um, but I think there's another thing that's often overlooked about Southeast Asian politics. Um, the region's politics are complex, highly so, and at the domestic level, um, you know, we'll leave our heads spinning. But from an international perspective, um, they're less contentious in some ways. And, and that's because Southeast Asia is comprised of smaller and middle-sized countries. They're vulnerable to great power competition. Um, they are oriented primarily towards development and stability. And as such, they're much less likely to engage in the kind of confrontation that Canada's found itself enmeshed in with, with China, for example, and now recently with India as well. Right? And so that makes, I would say, uh, Canada's foregrounding of Southeast Asia I almost look prescient. Um, in that um, you know, one year into an Indo-Pacific strategy, if we didn't have the focus on Southeast Asia, we'd be left scratching our heads to some extent, right? Now, Canada has a lot of ground to make up, and I think we'll, we'll get into that. Um, but, um, but I think certainly the prioritization of, of Southeast Asia is sensible. Um, Dewi, we, can we turn to you in uh, uh, Indonesia? And, um, Indonesia is, 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 is a pretty big mid-sized country uh, and has, is important in its own right, but in its leadership roles inside ASEAN and on its, uh, uh, own, uh, on its, own, on its own as a, an independent state. Um, can you give us a sense, Devi, of how uh, Indonesian views on what the Indo-Pacific framework uh, Indonesia was very active with Canada and others in the Asia-Pacific era. But what about uh, the take in Jakarta now on Indo-Pacific? Uh, there's an ASEAN outlook uh, on Indo-Pacific, uh, which was in place uh, three years ago. What does it look like now? Do you like the idea of Indo-Pacific? Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. And thank you very much for having me uh, in this conversation. Uh, if you look at back, Indonesia is actually one of the first countries to use Indo-Pacific in a document. Uh, former Foreign Minister Martina Talagawa, when he was still Foreign Minister in 2013, actually uh, suggested that we should have an Indo-Pacific Treaty of Friendship. Uh, at the time, the, the idea was not taken up because uh, after that, the President uh, Y uh, cabinets already ended, and then uh, the idea did not come up immediately. But if you remember, when the President Joko Widodo came, one of his differentiation of his foreign policy from the earlier period is that's the new emphasis on maritime domain. So Indonesia, being an archipelagic state, you know, has this archipelagic, archipelagic outlook from the very beginning. But for most of the uh, uh, Suharto period, the focus was very much land-based. Uh, the, the, the priority was very much on um, the uh, security of the land and the people, and the dominant uh, outlook was very much army-oriented. And the uh, change with Joko Widodo was when it, he may wanted to realize Indonesia's maritime outlook and making Indonesia into a global maritime park room. So because of that, the emphasis is on the ocean, you know, Indonesia, the Southeast Asia is right geographic center between the Indian Oceans and the Pacific Ocean. So when we look at the Indo-Pacific, really this is, you know, the looking at the, both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Oceans, not simply as contiguous, er, uh, uh, two contiguous areas, but rather as one geostrategic space. So that is very much seen from perspective of Jakarta. Uh, and and uh, at the time, Indonesia did not push immediately for an ASEAN Indo-Pacific strategy. But when uh, other countries, when the United States, when Japan came with its Indo-Pacific strategy, the free outlook, uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, there was a perception that the, the approach was much more uh, exclusive. There was a perception, at least from our part of the world, that this is more aimed against China. And that was why Indonesia and ASEAN, which has always been much more inclusive in nature, come up with the idea of an ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. And you, I think that you need to, we need to underline the fact is it's not an ASEAN strategy on Indo-Pacific. So Canada, Canada has an Indo-Pacific strategy, but ASEAN has an outlook on Indo-Pacific. What it wants to stress is, you know, the the the, the geographic, uh, the 
uh, unity of the geographic space, uh, uh, geostrategic space between the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Oceans, and you know, and, uh, uh, and Asia and Australia. Uh, but the but the emphasis is that you know we want to reiterate that ASEAN's approach is inclusive. It uh, uh, underlines the openness, the transparency, the inclusiveness, rule-based international order uh, that would bring in all countries, and that, that we do not want a new Indo-Pacific structure uh, or architecture. You know, we would like to use ASEAN centrality, make use of existing ASEAN mechanisms, which are already Indo-Pacific in its footprint from the very beginning. If you remember, in 1994, we had the ASEAN Regional Forum which already include all of the South Asian countries in, and also includes North Korea, Mongolia and, and, other Pacific, and Pacific countries, of course, like Canada, the United States and Australia and New Zealand and so on. So, but even though it's called the ASEAN Regional Forum, the membership is already Indo-Pacific. And then we have the East Asia Summit, which Canada will now would like to join. That again, the, uh, although it's called the East Asia Summit, uh, also, at the insistence of Indonesia, we already included not just ASEAN plus the three Northeast Asian countries, China, Japan, and South Korea, but also including within the East Asia Summit, Australia and New Zealand and India in the beginning, and then later on the United States and uh, the, the Russia also join in. So the, from the ASEAN perspective, from the Indonesian perspective, it's really that, you know, the unity of the Indian and the uh, 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 specific ocean, so the increasing saliency of the maritime domain, you know, the increasing uh, importance of the maritime domains, whether it's for security reasons, for economic reasons, and for people's uh, movements uh, reasons. And also, you know, um, the fact that um, it has to be inclusive. And that, I think that's the most important uh, fact that is, uh, you know, that we are driving from ASEAN. And again, as I said, it's not a strategy, it's an outlook. Right. Well, thank you, and that, that word inclusive is one we may return to a little bit later, what that means in terms of both uh, G, or the, the military uh, dimension of inclusiveness and security dimension, and also the economic dimension. What does inclusiveness mean, security or economics with, or security and economics against? Uh, and some of the, the Indo-Pacific blends both of those ideas together. So we'll return. Um, Alice Ba, uh, Alice, um, how do you think ASEAN is doing in positioning itself in the, in the ways that uh, Davy just suggested? Um, is ASEAN making a difference or, or is it um, a, uh, an eclipse as an important part of the dynamism of this new Indo-Pacific region? Sure. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, you know, I think um, ASEAN has tried to shape the shape the debate. You know, I think the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific was moved by, you know, a desire to basically uh, introduce or at least put into the discussion an alternative voice about a more inclusive Indo-Pacific. You know, I think, um, and I think that if you look at what ASEAN has done, you know, um, one of its important goals is to avoid these kinds of either or kinds of scenarios. Um, and so I think that that has been an important voice, right? Um, and that if it weren't for ASEAN making that argument, you know, we wouldn't be having a broader discussion about the Indo-Pacific. You know, I think I'll just simply add here too, I think we've been talking about the Indo-Pacific as if it is an agreed upon entity, right? If you look at even the Indo-Pacific key actors, they all have different conceptions of the Indo-Pacific, right? And I think ASEAN adds, right, another voice, right, that is about kind of inclusion, right, and trying to still search out a path that is more cooperative and aligns the different visions. So that's what I would say that ASEAN offers. And Diana, let's um, uh, bring Toronto into the discussion uh, and uh, your background uh, from, from Vietnam and your focus on economics. Um, there is considerable movement around different kinds of trade arrangements uh, in the region and uh, some of them are uh, uh, inclusive multilateralism of a sort that 
Southeast Asians have a particular interest in. Others are more exclusive. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, is a institution, a multilateral institution for cooperation, but it is an institution for cooperation with that is going to exclude or you know, tends to exclude a particular partner. Uh, it is not a uh, uh, the open, inclusive kind. How does the what does trade architecture look like right now in terms of uh, free trade, open free trade, the visions that went back to the Asia Pacific era? free trade areas kind of things, as compared to the now more restrictive, carefully managed uh, trade among partners, de-risking, uh, uh, and some of the other ideas around supply chain. But what's going on in the big picture? Well, there's lots going on, Paul, and thank you very much for having me today. Sorry, I can't be there in person. So. Um, so Canada is very concerned uh, and proud of its um, involvement in CPTPP. Um, but we don't talk much about RCEP. And I think RCEP is also a very interesting and something that we really need to pay more attention to. Um, I'm particularly, when I look at the um, what is happening on both sides, the countries that are really benefiting, I think, from the um, coincidence of CPTPP and RCEP are the ones that belong to both. So uh, you look at uh, Australia, New Zealand, for example, uh, Brunei, Singapore, Japan, Vietnam, and Malaysia. And of course, what strikes me when I look at this is, you know, no matter uh, how much any country wants, uh, whether you call it de-risking or decoupling, uh, it's all about China and people's dependence on China uh, in terms of supply chains. China still supplies so much of what we uh, think of even as coming from uh, ASEAN countries, because it's those countries, especially uh, Vietnam, for example, that have really benefited from uh, the China plus one strategy or de-risking or whatever you want to call it. So I think that's something that we also have to pay attention to. And that is really why ASEAN is kind of the linchpin uh, of all of this uh, because of its uh, geography, as mentioned earlier, uh, its demography, um, and the fact that uh, so many uh, companies have decided that they need to have uh, another source of um, production uh, that is close to China, but not in China. So um, I think going forward, this is going to be very important for Canada to pay attention to all of these uh, developments. Canada now wants to uh, become a part of IPEF. I don't know whether that's going to happen. And um, I'm thinking, I have a particular interest in digital trade, and I think that that is going to evolve as well. Um, Diana, let's then uh, turn to a second round, and I'll, and I'll actually start with you uh, immediately on this. Um, in terms of, you, you almost were making a case for Canadian membership in RCEP. Uh, I'm teasing you. But the idea of a free trade area of Asia Pacific, which is notional at this stage, but is, is still alive. Um, what do you think is the best priority items for Ottawa in introducing, injecting herself more deeply into the, 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 the architecture of trade policy uh, in the region? Where should be our focus? Is IPEF valuable to Canada? Um. IPEF would certainly be valuable to Canada. IPEF, of course, is not a trade agreement. It's what the uh, U.S. came up with uh, when it was no longer involved in CPTPP. But let's not focus on trade agreements per se, but rather all of the ancillary benefits that go with uh, actual discussions on issues that can be covered by trade agreements. Um, a lot of the uh, goods, a lot of the goods manufacturing um, is already covered in trade agreements. So I think what is more interesting is uh, digital and services, as I just mentioned. And I think that's where Canada needs to uh, pay attention in terms of looking at the future 
and what the what future benefits uh, will accrue, uh, the more that people are able to um, trade in services on on data. Uh, they say that data is the new oil, but also when you're looking at some of the other uh, interesting developments in terms of uh, green energy transition, which is important to Canada, and um, other areas where trade agreements may not play as great a role, but what is more important is on the regulatory side and ensuring that whatever it is that you want to be trading in a way is not hampered in any way by uh, regulatory regimes. Okay. Um, and uh, the uh, let, let's talk about perceptions of Canada. And Davy, um, ask you a frank question: Has Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy attracted much attention in Indonesia? And if so, what is the analysis? Is Canada moving in the new necessary direction, or is it Canada departing from some of its older and departing from some of its older principles? Uh, and its pattern in past interaction. What do you think about Canada? Well, the Indonesians, well, ASEAN in general, like Canada, you know, Canada has always been seen as a good guy. And I used to be very active also in a lot of middle power activities in the region, for example, or particularly with uh, Indonesia, it's very active in the early years in uh, uh, sponsoring the workshop on managing conflicts in the South China Sea. It seems it was a bit quiet for a while, but to be frank with you, the Canada Indo-Pacific strategy, we've heard about it, those of us who do read the Jakarta Post uh, and international news, but uh, maybe because it is not controversial because it's, I've just been looking at it and uh, because I was invited by the uh, Ambassador of Canada just a few days ago, and he distributed this Canada, Canadian Indo-Pacific strategy to us. You know, they're they are quite innocuous, you know, and very broad based and not controversial. Uh, so probably because it's not controversial, probably will not attract as much attention as those that have tried, you know, to be much more confrontational and so on. So I, I would argue that uh, uh, the ASEAN region will be very uh, welcoming to Canada uh, trying to play an active role again, again, you know. Uh, although your diplomats say, you know, it's not true. Canada has not never been away, you know. But the, the perception is that it has not been as visible in the past few years as it was, you know, say in the late nineties and the early two thousand. And I, I know personally, I welcome, you know, this, this strategy. Um, in the prior session, uh, uh, the general mentioned the rule-based international order uh, on several occasions, and it's been a plank in uh, uh, the Canadian approach on uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy and, and the discussion points of our diplomats. Um, Kai, um, what do you think regional reactions have been to the discussion, or to the idea of a rule-based international order? We heard a challenge from the floor on this a few minutes ago, and it is genuinely a lively discussion in the region. What's your take on this? I'll ask Alice. Uh, That's right. Thing. I think there's a, there's a degree of cynicism when the region hears rules-based order, and the sense is that rules-based order means what the United States wants it to mean at any given point and whatever aligns with U.S. interests. And I, I, I agree also that there's a degree of ambiguity about what it means. Um, I think the general pointed out something that many in the region will, will say is correct. Uh, smaller states, middle, middle-sized states, whether in terms of actual size or, or, or political and economic might, are uncomfortable with outside powers imposing their will on them. Right? And I think it's often seen, or perception is the fear is that rules-based order is a way of doing that. Um, part of this is because the, the, whether it is Canada or the West, the, the reputation in the region is, is mixed. I think the region has benefited from attention from the United States, from, from Canada in terms of development, certainly, but not all of the attention has been positive. And we look back to the Cold War that, um, that was anything but cold in Southeast Asia as an example of that. Right? And there is, there's real fear, again, that the rules-based order has implied within it 
the inevitability of conflict between China and the United States. And, and again, as I alluded to earlier, I think a common sentiment around Southeast Asia is that the region has more to lose from great power tensions than any other. And so really any, any of the buzzwords, whether it's rules-based order, whether it's like-mindedness, I mean, they, they resonate to some extent, but to a limited extent. And there's, there's fear as well about um, what they imply about the greater, the greater world order. Alice, what do you think? I'm going to basically agree with some of Kai's points and maybe add, you know, two others. You know, I think, you know, RBO rules rules based order is one of been one of the most kind of ambiguous terms that has been, become so widely used, right? And I think, you know, um, you know, Professor Narayan made a good point earlier. You know, if it was about international law, then we'd talk about international law, but it's rules based order. Um, and so it has become very associated with the U.S. agenda, right? Um, I think, and so as a result, then that becomes much more unilateral. Um, and so I think that it is kind of a problematic, contested term, right? Um, the two points that I would add to the ones that Kai has already made is one is trade, and two is also human rights. Right? So on the trade front, I think that if we're going to talk about RBO, rules-based order, you know, from Southeast Asian's point of view, maintaining the, 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 the you know, trading rules is also very important, right? The trading, the multilateral trading system is very important. I think the second, you know, on the human rights question, you know, I think this is, you know, I think, you know, this is, um, Maybe it's um, getting a little bit out of the question, but you know, like there's some mixed reactions also, to, you know, to this question in terms of the human rights. You know, Thailand definitely, you know, feels that you know RBO is used, you know, against it, you know, um, but not against others, right? For example, you know, it doesn't view, right, um, you know, the United States as a particularly dependable ally in that sense, and that's interesting you know, point because it comes from both, you know, different sides of the political spectrum on this view, right? Um, so I think um, RBO is a problematic term, um, and I, I think we should recognize it as such. Davy, how do you react to the rules-based international order kind of vocabulary and vision? Well, if you look at it, you know, yes, rules-based international order, we are all for it. I mean, after all, you know, we, are, we all support international laws. We all support the UN-based multilateral systems uh, that uphold that rules-based international order. But there is, you know, this, this perception that somehow superpowers are above the rules-based international order. You know, they can violate with impunity in violating international, uh, uh, the UN Charter about not uh, invading other countries which violate, you know, the, the sacredness of territorial integrity of sovereignty. United States does that, Russia does that, and China is accused of, uh, you know, of carrying out uh, sort of aggressions also like in, uh, uh, in particularly in the South China Sea, violating uh, the, uh, the, left, the spirits of the uh, UNCLOS. But for, if you look at uh, ASEAN countries, you know, the, the the rule of law is specifically mentioned in the ASEAN Charter as well as in the ASEAN Outdoor Indo-Pacific. So I would argue that we need to have this rule and rules-based international order, but we take it at face value so that everybody must carry out the, you know, the rules as uh, they were written in the spirits that they were meant to be when, when they were created, you know, to protect national uh, sovereignty to protect territorial integrity, but also later on when we develop, you know, the, the, uh, the sense of uh, international responsibility to protect also towards human rights and democracy, you know, we should also continue to do that. And, and for smaller and medium, medium scale countries, you know, the only protections against big powers is through laws, through international institutions, through the, the, the rules. So uh, what we like to do is to call on the big powers, you know, to to walk the talk, and not to weaponize, uh, you know, the the rules based international uh, this international order, only uh, interpreting it to their interests. 
and therefore uh, behaviors that are seen as hypocritical or double standards are uh, actually undermining the rule of basic international orders. And we know at the moment that usually there's not small countries that are doing that, but uh, big countries and also like the behavior of, you know, what is happening now in the Middle East, you know, let's mention that uh, what's happening in Gaza where uh, we see uh, the United States continue to be totally uncritical about what the Israeli uh, forces are doing in Gaza, where thousands and thousands of civilians are being killed, mostly women and children, uh, and not a squeak about protections of human rights. Uh, Diana, on rules-based international order, who's going to make the rules uh, for the next generation of economic interactions in the region? Um, can I just go back to something that was <laughs> mentioned? Uh, no, I will get to that. But I think one of the things that really came out uh, during Japan's um, chairmanship of G7 is uh, economic coercion and the notion of economic security. And this is related to the rules-based order because essentially economic coercion is operating outside of the order. And it's done by superpowers. And it's countries in ASEAN who suffer from this, and Canada su has suffered from it, both from the United States and from China. So, in terms of um, making the, in terms of making the rules, we can't seem to be able to come together to agree on the rules, except on on, and the multilateral trading system is under threat from that. On the other hand, though, there are some. Um, movements to create rules about things that we do care about, uh, including on, uh, the, on the digital side. So I think that the uh, notion of creating new rules um, will be important, obviously. Um, but I think where Canada could play a role is helping to create a rules-based order that benefits not only the superpowers, but everybody else who depends upon them. That's a tall order. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about ASEAN Southeast Asia from a slightly different angle. And that's how strong ASEAN is as an organization. We've been for some years looking at the concept of ASEAN centrality and what it means. Um, how strong an organization is ASEAN at this stage? Can it bear the weight of what many people hope it will play in this very tangled geopolitical context? How strong is ASEAN? Kai? This is a big question. <laughs> ASEAN as an organization has well-known limits, of course. It's often dismissed as a talking shop. Um, it's been under particular strain in the last two years, given the civil war in Myanmar that um, the regional organization has not found an effective response to. Um, I think nonetheless, ASEAN is strong as an organization for the role that it plays, which is to get Southeast Asian countries who often have very different interests together and converging on a single message. Not always, obviously, on the South China Sea, it's been ineffective at times. There are many other issue areas where, where that convergence hasn't happened. But the fact that we are in this room talking about Southeast Asia as a coherent region, when we reference the size of the economies of Southeast Asia, we talk about the region, we talk about regional perspectives. That is a result of, of what ASEAN enables, right? this collective voice. So in that sense, I think for all of the institutional weaknesses that the organization itself has, the product that it creates, the, the, this, this idea of regional unity is incredibly powerful. Alice, why don't you, you take that one on and, and, and address the key issue that many Canadians are uh, agonized about is developments in Myanmar. Uh, sure. and uh, the new stage of the struggle. Is this a sign of uh, ASEAN uh, irrelevance, weakness, uh, or uh, something more positive? So I think most of us who have been following you know, um, this issue would probably agree that Myanmar you know, poses one of the biggest threats 
right, or challenges. Challenges is probably the better word, I think. Challenges to us in as an organization, right? It is, it involves a member of its own, right? It is, it is an organization, by the way, that is premised, right, on the unity of Southeast Asia, right? Security is defined as the unity of Southeast Asia. And that puts the, the organization in a very difficult spot in terms of how to deal with the organization or with, with no Myanmar, right? We do have differences of opinion, right? Ranges of interests within Myanmar. Um, or, or on Myanmar within ASEAN, and so that has been a challenge. Um, but I would also argue, right, that there, so, you know, number one, despite the differences on Myanmar, right, there has been consensus, right, they have agreed there is a consensus on Myanmar. Now, that is, of course, contingent on the fact that, you know, Thailand had a critical change in government recently, right? And so that was important because before that, right, there, there was kind of a fragment or a two-track kind of a, 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 a approach going on, one that was not, you know, complete, that, that was not bought into by the organization collectively, right? But the change in, in government in Thailand has changed that, right? I think the second thing, right, is that, you know, I guess I'll make just two more things I'm, I'm gonna stop. You know, I think that the Myanmar case, ASEAN is challenged, you know, to, in terms of what it can do about Myanmar. You know, in the end, um, Myanmar is one of the prickliest regimes in Southeast Asia, you know, and so you can't impose, you know, on Myanmar, and so you have to work with Myanmar, right? Um, and then uh, I had a third point, but I forgot, and maybe I'll come back later. Thanks. Uh, Davey, we need to hear from you on this one. Uh, ASEAN, Myanmar, uh, the uh, relative success uh, of it playing a central role in the solution to, or at least the management of a deteriorating situation. Well, it's clearly, uh, it's not been very successful. Uh, the ASEAN uh, invited the hunter uh, in, 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 to Jakarta with a, during the uh, special uh, meeting uh, in February, uh, in April 2021, and came up with a five-point consensus, um, namely to end the hostilities in Myanmar, uh, to allow humanitarian access, to appoint an ASEAN envoy, uh, to hold an uh, all-party dialogue, and for all of the for the envoy to meet all the parties. Um, that hasn't happened. Uh, the uh, violence has continued, and uh, and, and more people have uh, lost their lives uh, in Myanmar. And that was admitted uh, by the uh, uh, chair of ASEAN now, Indonesia. You know, they came out that it's not much development there. But it's also we have to recognize that when you are dealing with an internal conflicts on the internal civil wars, there's also a limit of what an outsider can do. It is not for ASEAN to bring peace to Myanmar. What ASEAN can do is to try to facilitate, you know, uh, and, and to try to find ways and means to bring the different uh, parties together. And, and ASEAN is continuing to do that. With the Indonesia through its uh, Office of Special Envoy, is trying to meet different groups. Uh, it's not been that successful. Uh, but I think the second thing is that you said about ASEAN as, as an organization. Uh, there is now a tension between ensuring ASEAN unity on the other one hand, and also making sure that ASEAN remains effective on effective. the other. Yeah, and, and, and for this, you know, ASEAN uh, has been in a bind. The ASEAN has a charter, and in the charter, it has principles besides respect for each other's sovereignty and non-interference in each other's internal affairs, new values like democracy and human rights, rule of laws, as well as constitutional change of government are written in the charter. But the charter does not have an enforcement mechanism. In the original draft of the charter, it actually said that, you know, if a member state uh, violates the principles of the charter, uh, it could actually uh, receive sanctions. You know, like the Commonwealth countries do sanction, you know, the Commonwealth organization sanctions a member state, for example, uh, that uh, uh, carried out an un un unconstitutional form of government, like what happened in Fiji uh, at one point. And ASEAN doesn't have that. And now, you know, with this crisis in Myanmar, I think that is also transformative to ASEAN because ASEAN said, you know, we doesn't want to be held hostage. In the past, ASEAN allowed itself to be held hostage by Myanmar. 
when the European Union said, you know, we will not allow Myanmar to come in to join in ASEAN uh, in Asia U uh, European uh, meeting, then ASEAN said, well, if Myanmar is not coming, then ASEAN is not coming. But now ASEAN said, you know, we will not, uh, we continue to uh, hold, uh, to help Myanmar, uh, but helping Myanmar, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, it has to be up to the members and the people in Myanmar themselves to come together. And usually an internal conflict, it takes time. Uh, but secondly, to ensure that ASEAN will continue to be able to do the kind of things it's expected of ASEAN to do, to build, to bring peace and development to the wider Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian region, as well as you know to manage relations with the external powers to play the centrality role. And here, by disinviting the Hanta to ASEAN meeting, by not in, inviting the political leaders of Hanta, because. ASEAN does not recognize the legitimacy of Hunter. I think this is creating a precedent uh, in, in ASEAN. It is, in fact, imposing already uh, a de facto sanction on Myanmar. And uh, at the last ASEAN summit has also been decided, you know, ASEAN will try to make itself more agile in decision-making process. In political security arena, usually it's absolute consensus. So that means that a member state actually has a veto for the whole ASEAN decisions. And now, uh, because of the problem in Myanmar, uh, it's been decided that you know ASEAN will be much more flexible in its consensus. So we'll see that the crisis in Myanmar will actually uh, also uh, push for uh, institutional uh, transformation of, of ASEAN. Hmm. Uh, Diana, anything to add? Yes, I would just say, um, it building on what Debbie was saying, but taking it in a slightly different direction. The notion of development, I think, has been key to ASEAN. Very vast differences in economic and um, political um, might, shall we say, um, between them. And I think where Canada would have a role, along with perhaps partners such as Japan and Korea, is offering ASEAN another uh, option, uh, other options in terms of infrastructure investment, for example, where ASEAN doesn't want to have to choose. ASEAN's leaders are polled and show that they don't like China so much, but on the other hand, they are dependent on China. They don't like when the US is flexing its muscles in a way that harms them. So I guess the, the question is, where can we play a role uh, in terms of development, which is really the key, one of the key objectives of ASEAN? Well, that leads to a natural transition, this focus on development and uh, some of the Chinese perspectives on uh, their new uh, 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 framework for pushing a new kind of international order that focuses on development in a different way. But let's focus this one on the China dimension uh, of the puzzle. Uh, what can we learn from ASEAN Southeast Asian countries management of multiple China challenges? One of those is on South China Sea uh, and the uh, uh, slow progress uh, in uh, uh, resolving uh, a whole set of really difficult tensions that have military aspects. So we have a China, South China Sea issue, how ASEAN has tried to, and individual countries have tried to manage the China question. But there's a bigger overall question. David premised, premised around the idea of inclusive institutions that bring China into them, is, is, the, is, the, is the tagline for what that's really about. Is, is what do we have to learn from ASEAN in managing relations with a rising, more assertive, uh, and in some ways difficult China? We always turn these to you first, Kai, because you're the youngest. <laughs> it's again a big question. Um, and I think it's a difficult one to answer in part because of course, the relationship, the bilateral relationships between the member countries of ASEAN and China vary quite a bit. We range from relatively friendly through much more tense, of course. But I think one, one collective feature of ASEAN, its positioning vis-a-vis -vis China, is the recognition that as the region's great power and as 
a collection of much smaller countries in China's backyard. China has to be lived with, right? The notion that, um, that Southeast Asian countries can decouple from China, which is the largest trading partner of every Southeast Asian country, is, is, is a non-starter, right? And that um, lived with means many things. Obviously, it means very different things for the Philippines and Vietnam with uh, regular confrontations around the South China Sea, the East Philippines, the West Philippine Sea, or, or, um, or the East Sea in Vietnam. Um, for Singapore, uh, which has robust, long-standing relations, or Malaysia with, with China, it means different things yet. But, but that common feature of this is our reality for the foreseeable future, for the next 50 years, for the next 100 years, China will be a major global power and has to be lived with somehow. Alice? I was actually going to start with that same point. China's not going away, right? And so, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, ASEAN and Southeast Asia's responses, you know, to China, I mean, I think that that's the starting point. Right? So that's the starting point. You can't decouple from it. You can't cut China off. And so you have to try to figure out ways to live with it. Right? I think on the, and I'll use your examples, right? So you had the South China Sea example. I think the South China Sea is actually a good example, right? As we know, South China Sea has been a highly challenging you know, situation for maritime Southeast Asia. Right? And I emphasize maritime Southeast Asia. Um, but, you know, if you look at how some of these states have been dealing with, and that includes, right, I mean, Vietnam and the Philippines, right, that on the one hand, right, they're pursuing closer relations with the United States, right, in terms of broadening their strategic cooperation. Um, but on the other hand, you also still see continued outreach to China, right, visits to China. You also have, you know, a, a first participation in a China-hosted military exercise by both Vietnam and the Philippines, right? Um, you know, and so these are important kind of examples of how states are trying to still keep these avenues, right, open, you know, to, you know, work with China, right? Um, you know, even recognize, and still, of course, taking some other steps, you know, to, you know, kind of push back, right, in other ways, right? But it's important to maintain the dialogue. Similarly, inclusive institutions, um, you know, I think, you know, this is true when they were first created, the ASEAN frameworks, right? The importance of inclusive dialogue, the importance of having mechanisms beyond, for example, alliance partners. You know, you know, di in, you know that is um, that is part of kind of acceptance that you know those in the, that you have to work with China. Hmm. Uh, Davy, what do you think? How your uh, uh, your approaches to China are uh, what we can learn from them? Well, I mean, for the new IR, you know, I, I've just actually actually wrote uh, I published an article earlier this year in the Pacific Review. Uh, on Indonesia is called Indonesia's Hedging Plus Policy in the Face of China's Rise and U.S.-China Rivalry. So we, uh, all Southeast Asian countries hedge, uh, meet, uh, trying to maximize benefits, but also mitigating risks. Uh, but for uh, Indonesia, it's also, you know, doing middle power diplomacy through ASEAN. But if you look at it, you know, not, not, not taking only the snapshot of what is happening now, but looking at the centuries of Southeast Asia's relations with major powers. Southeast Asia has always been at the crossroads of trades, of civilizations, of cultures. China, India, Arabs, Europeans, you know, actually the Arabs and the Chinese and the Indians have all, all came to Southeast Asia to trade and they left their civilizations, they intermarried. They did not bring wars. It was only when the Europeans came that they brought war because through their more exclusivist, mercantilist policies. And, and now I think that what ASEAN is doing is just borrowing from what South Asia has always been doing. We never put our eggs in one basket. You know, it's always been able to multi-engage. Uh, we've always been extremely promiscuous. We diversify uh, our links, uh, taking the best from everyone, and, but adopt, adopting and adapting and creating, you know, uh, civilizations in Southeast Asia with this distinct, you know, this Chinese influence, Indian influence, 
Islamic influence, European influence, but you can tell that they are Southeast Asians. And I think we'll continue to do that. You know, that the traditional wisdom of Southeast Asia being open is what is informing ASEAN openness and inclusiveness. Uh, we don't, you don't need to tell Southeast Asia to be wary of China. We know. We have lived through centuries of that. Uh, we don't need to be told to be wary of Japan or to be wary of, of uh, the United States. You know, we've all gone through that, that period. So for us, you know, the most important thing is to engage uh, all sides, but at the same time, you know, not to be over dependent on anyone. Vulnerability is when you are, we don't have choices, when you become too dependent. So either becoming too dependent on the West, on the West or becoming too dependent on Japan or on China is bad for you. So the most important thing is, you know, get what you can get, but also mitigate your risk. You know, this word promiscuity is not one that we normally like to use in diplomatic terms, but this sounds like a strategy of uh, hug and kiss and then sometimes hug and slap uh, as, a, uh, uh, as, a, as, as a way of managing. Uh, what, um, uh, Diana, anything you'd like to add on what we can learn from Southeast Asia on the China question? Um, just building on what Debbie just had to say about um, hedging strategies, and I agree with her 100% that there is definitely something that we can all learn on navigating the shoals of uh, great power rivalry, um, which I think Southeast Asian nations have uh, excelled in. But when you look at the overall economic trends, um, so there's more and more uh, Asian um, in investment and integration, the development of double supply chains to avoid a 100% um, dependence, dependence. On, on China from that perspective. I think that uh, looking at Asian countries are investing in each other. They're trading with each other. They're becoming uh, an important market in their own right. And I think that that has uh, big implications for outside partners. And to the extent that, um, and I always bring it back to Canada because it's where I am, but uh, to the extent that Canada can, can insert itself into this through APEC or CPTPP or where, wherever it is, um, not necessarily trade agreements, but just ensuring that we are invested uh, both from a people perspective uh, and a business perspective and from a security perspective. Uh, we have to be seen to be a reliable partner. Uh, you know, it's dangerous in any meeting to bring in sporting metaphors. Uh, and uh, there's a, an American uh, baseball player named Yogi Berra who has this famous line that uh, when you get to a fork in the road, you take it. Uh, and uh, in that trade policy, <laughs> we're, uh, I think on the Canadian side, we're, we're taking two sides. We want some of the Asia-Pacific style trade arrangements, negotiated, inclusive multilateralism. But we also want to partner with groups that are doing things that are in specific Canadian interests. Uh, and uh, the potential participation in IPEF is just, just an example of that. So taking from pros promiscuity to forks in the road, uh, with that as a background, let's turn to questions or comments from the group here. Um, and feel free to, um, do, you don't need to ask a question if you'd like to challenge or raise a point that is on your mind. Uh, this is a perfect, perfect setting. And as I say, academics cannot be in the first round of this uh, discussion from the floor. But the microphones are now open. Please. Can I correct one thing that oh, I think a I correction. Said? correction. I think it was Vietnam and Malaysia that participated in the China exercise, so I just wanted to correct Point noted. Uh, please don't be shy. Craig Wilson, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a, well, I guess here, a Green Tech Asia is a, a connection. I, I, I feel like I'm in the position of the teenage boy uh, asking about promiscuity and just how far will you go? But that is my question in, in a broader strategic sense. 
I, my connections with Indon in Indonesia are limited, but I've been there several times, and I have the sense uh, from a favorite writer of mine, David Wolf of the Financial Times, that Indone Indonesia is a looming major power and will be one of the eight largest economies in the world by, say, 2050, uh, if not earlier. So I think my question is, I'm very interested to know, Davy, how you see your arc of, of influence changing or evolving as you start to take, because you're such a multi, multi-talented partner, uh, including the, the, the Muslim reality, uh, it's, it's very interesting your potential connect with a lot of parts of the world where the rest of us have some difficulties. And if I can put a specific question to that, do you see Indonesia taking a much larger, a greater influence in both ASEAN and internationally? And then uh, a, a perhaps a comment about what a, the smaller powers that aren't going to be great powers like that, just in terms of demographics, what do smaller powers need to do to uh, enable work with uh, Indonesia better? And that's something that applies to Canada. Thank you. Davy, could you hear that? Could you hear the question? Yes, yes yeah. I can. Yeah. Okay, Indonesian leadership, what do you think? Well, I think Indonesian leadership is less about Indonesia as a country, it's more about the leader, the personality. Because if you remember, uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, Indonesia is still very poor, but President Sukarno, you know, liked to play in the global stage and really took uh, Indonesia, uh, put Indonesia on the map, not always uh, positively, because uh, while it uh, uh, took a leadership role in holding the first Asian African conference, which is still referred to, you know, as the Bandung okay. spirit uh, by, by countries in, in Africa and Asia and Latin America. Apparently, the Bandung spirit is still uh, referred to quite quite often. But I remember uh, Sukarno confronted Malaysia. Uh, so how to focus on, on ASEAN. Uh, President SBY was active on the global stage. President Joko Widodo was less active, uh, much more transactional. So here, the personality of the Indonesian president uh, actually determines uh, how Indonesia plays, whether it's much more inward looking or more outward looking. But for Indonesia, it has not just been about ASEAN only or playing the global stage only. Indonesia looks at ASEAN as its inner circle, you know, the, 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 the first ring in the circle, in the concentric circle of foreign policy. Uh, so it is the cornerstone of the foreign policy. If we do not have good neighbor policy, if you don't have good regional stability and prosperity, it would be very difficult for Indonesia to feel secure or safe to play in the global stage. But Indonesia, as you mentioned, is the world the, uh, the world largest Muslim nation. In the past, uh, Indonesians have tended to be much more humble and a bit hesitant to um, elevate this Muslim Islamic credential because uh, in, uh, Southeast Asian Islam is regarded as uh, not quite it, you know, and the, the, and, uh, uh, somehow less than its Middle Eastern uh, counterpart. Uh, that Southeast Asia is more like in the, the periphery. But recently, with a lot of uh, problems in the Middle East, at the same time, you know, the development in Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia has become, you know, a vibrant democracy and the economy is developing uh, quite rapidly. Uh, Malaysia too, uh, it's a vibrant uh, economy, a vibrant society. There's greater self-confidence. So uh, there's also trying, you know, there's also an attempt to uh, project in the Islam, which is much more inclusive, which is much more moderate, where Islam, democracy and uh, women's uh, empowerment, you know, can walk hand in hand. You know, that's the, the uh, international uh, image of Indonesia that President uh, you do, you know, for example, try to project. Uh, Jokowi has been less active on that because he's much more interested on uh, economic diplomacy. But I imagine maybe a future president who is much more international in his outlook could also take this up again. And the non aligned movement, uh, at the end of the war, they say, you know, what is the relevance of the non aligned movement? But now with 
all of this multipolarity right. or multiplexity uh, the, the, the is becoming much more salient again. Uh, so uh, for Indonesia, there's a saying that ASEAN for us is too big for a handkerchief, I say, you know, and it's too small for a tablecloth. Uh, you cannot, uh, so for big country, for its economy, ASEAN is too small for Indonesia, and also for its diplomatic activism, for its energy, excess energy, uh, ASEAN is not never ever going to be uh, sufficient in its own right. But it doesn't mean that Indonesia will ever regard ASEAN to be less important. It remains to be the primary foundation. But, uh, you know, uh, Indonesia, I think, uh, should play a more uh, global role as well on climate change issues, on, on human rights issues, you know, on, on other uh, uh, major uh, issues that uh, countries should uh, look at wider multilateralism. And I think, you know, Indonesia and Canada uh, do should work together to again uh, strengthen uh, multilateralism. Uh, Davy, I'm not sure if we should nominate you to be, run for the presidency uh, in Indonesia. But as I heard you talk near the end, maybe maybe Secretary General of the United Nations uh, coming into uh, coming into your future. Um, we uh, have uh, Sean. You had a, a chance before. Let me just. Is there anyone else that's coming up? I see a gentleman here. Please. Hi. Hello. Uh, I'm Maki Kusnami from Japanese Embassy. Um, so I'm not from the academia, so I think I'm entitled to. <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so actually, this is a comment, really, because um, uh, in the discussion, uh, we sense some skepticism and cynicism about uh, rules-based order idea and uh, uh, or the international order based on the rule of law uh, idea. And of course, coming from a country, uh, that has been maybe one of the earlier, or maybe Absolutely. some of the earliest uh, advocates of the uh, Indo-Pacific idea. Uh, I thought I should maybe jump in here. Um, <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to, actually just doing that, I just wanted to echo what Major General Smith mentioned and also what uh, Professor um, uh, Horton, uh, Diane Horton from Toronto mentioned. Um, uh, you know, it's not, I think, the, 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 neither the Indo-Pacific uh, idea or the rules-based order or international order based on rule of law is not just a fancy word. It's, it reflects um, our sense of uh, meeting the real challenges. And then um, Major General Smith mentioned uh, uh, some uh, difficulty and challenges, including um, attempts to uh, change the status quo uh, unilaterally, uh, force coercion, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, Ms. Horton, uh, Professor Horton mentioned uh, economic coercion. And uh, uh, of course, when we have those challenges, um, uh, how best to share the challenges and uh, um, uh, rules-based order or international law, uh, sorry, international uh, uh, order based on the uh, the rule of, rule of law. Um, I think it's it's just an expression of we have to meet these challenges, and then we don't necessarily have to be too apologetic uh, in the use of these ideas. Of course, these uh, these have to be. Uh, we have to really explain that this is not an arbitrary thing, but, uh, 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 and, uh, but I think we have, we have to really um, uh, come back to why were you really using that, and we don't think that we have to be apologetic. And then I also wanted to just comment on what Professor Evans said. Uh, you sounded like it's either Asia-Pacific ideal of, uh, uh, of uh, inclusive uh, uh, trade uh, 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 agreements, and or either is a uh, um, more specific uh, collaboration. I don't think it has to be either one or that. I think it can be really both, and that's what we are, I think, pursuing. So thank you very much for my, for your that, that fork in the road, take both. <laughs> that's good. Thank you for that comment. That's very helpful, and I think this discussion of rule-based international order is going to circulate around uh, through through more of the discussion. There's what we just have uh, about three minutes left. Um, can um, uh, this gentleman and Sean? We will give you an academic's 
last 30 seconds. Hi, Paul. Uh, Bart Adesh, formerly a director at the Asian Development Bank, now with uh, APF and McGill University's Institute for the Study of International Development. So uh, this session has focused on Southeast Asia and ASEAN, obviously. Uh, and among the topics we've talked about are, are trade issues. Uh, we have uh, the CPTPP that already includes four members of ASEAN. So I'm wondering uh, if any of the panelists have a view as to whether or not Canada is getting as much as it can out of the CPTPP. And related, Canada is in the midst of a negotiation on an economic partnership with Indonesia. And there's already been some six rounds of negotiations on this. And looking to Delhi, I'm wondering, do you have a view as to the prospects for a successful completion of this proposed Indonesia-Canada economic partnership? So CPTPP sure. and this partnership. Thank you, Paul, and Thank panelists. You. Thank you. And um, I'll turn back to the panelists just for one minute at the end. Uh, Sean, you, you have to do it in one sentence. That's impossible. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, <laughs> academics, academics. Uh, I'm one of them. Um, okay. Well, we're just at end, and we've, we've covered a lot of ground. That was intentional to be a discussion starter that's going to be running across some of the other sessions later in the day. Uh, but um, if I could ask each of the four panelists to, in two to three sentences, uh, come up with what is their principal recommendation for what Canada should be doing better with Southeast Asia. Jeff Nankavell is here. The Asia Pacific Foundation is setting up an office in that part of the world. Um, what are some of the ideas they should have in the back of their mind? But only one idea. And we'll go in the same order. Kai, what do you want? I have a list of six ideas. So I'll pick the top one on it, which is show up. <laughs> show up often, show up at high levels. The first year of the IPS was a good start, but also at lower levels, coming with ideas on how Canada and Southeast Asia can work more effectively together, but also being prepared to listen. Air Canada will like your message, okay, with their new roots. Alice? I think that Canada's, you know, um, uh, probably, um, best thing that they could do is economically engage Southeast Asia. Got it. Uh, Deanna? I would say, adding on to the first two, uh, harness the private sector. The government can't do it all. We have a lot of expertise. We already have a lot of investment in Asia. Let's make it easier and facilitate private sector involvement. Uh, Dr. Davey, what's your one suggestion for Canada? Well, I support all the other three, but uh, I'll add, you know, this middle power diplomacy. I think that we should harness the middle power uh, coalition here. Uh, Canada with middle power Indonesia and Canada with ASEAN as a middle power uh, organization uh, and, and create more space, space including in ensuring uh, rule of law will be implemented, you know, uh, with integrity. Okay. Well, that um, uh, is, is a nice ending point for this opening discussion. And it's important that we've opened the discussion through a discussion of uh, the Southeast Asian dimension of this. It could have been done by focusing on the North Pacific. We could have done it on, uh, Indo on the Indian side. Of the Indian Ocean side, but the decision was by the organizers to have us begin thinking into a next phase of these matters through looking at Southeast Asia. This is our particular window where we might be able to uh, punch a little bit uh, uh, above our weight. Uh, in so with that, let me. Um, uh, uh, I, I have my own personal views on these matters. Uh, I write uh, books and articles on Southeast Asia, and uh, I've personally felt that it is essential that we use Southeast Asia as that window for managing uh, uh, our, our entry into a, into a region and mobilizing Canadians for it. Uh, that uh, uh, is, is so important.
to our future. So with that, let me thank the four panelists. Thank the technicians, by the way, who brought in Davy and Diana really beautifully. They're like they're in the room. We miss you both here, by the way, and I hope there'll be another occasion when you both will be here in person. But I think it really worked technically and um, would encourage those of you who are in this session and are gonna be staying on, please try to find a way to say one thing during the later portions of the sessions. Uh, come in with your views. It's really important to hear the views. We really appreciated the Japanese uh, uh, diplomat uh, who made a very important comment. You don't have to, you don't have to be a question but to get some views into this discussion. We have to talk about these matters. With that, IPD, Canada West Foundation, thank you. Take a break for 30 seconds till we change. Uh, you don't get to go far because we turn to uh, Indo-Pacific security architecture, the Quad, AUKUS, and NATO, topics that uh, will hit a different part of your brain than what we just did. <laughs> but for the panelists, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.